Do you know what love is? The average person thinks they know what love is because they feel it. Perhaps they even said it. The Chazonish said that what the average person thinks is love is forbidden according to the Torah. In fact, the average person does not even know what love even looks like, feels like, and perhaps never even heard about what it is. Because they connect it to things that are tangible, physical, and not the spiritual worlds. Tonight, the Ramban's Igeret HaKodesh is going to rewire our hearts. It's trained our minds, it's trained our bodies, and it's trained our psychological state in order to prepare for what Jewish intimacy is supposed to be. And tonight, it's going to rewire our hearts to let us know and re-educate us about what love really is. For all of those people that say they love you to their spouse, it's time you ask yourself, do you really love them or yourself? For all of those that say they love God, it's time you ask yourself, do you love God or yourself? Tonight, you'll have the answer to both of those questions. And you'll also have the solution for when the answer you got perhaps is not what you hoped for. Enjoy, share, and be holy. We're back here on our Tuesday night lecture about the uh, Jewish intimacy series, Baruch Hashem, a series that has certainly transformed many lives in uh, much more ways than uh, we thought possible. Uh, Baruch Hashem, the power of Torah, is a uh, is truly unbelievable. And last week's uh, shiur, we had a uh, person that was a anti-Semite, for as long as he can remember, changes ways, and Baruch Hashem has been commenting on all of our lectures because he's watching them and he know, loves the Torah, Baruch Hashem. Uh, so if the Torah can do that from uh, this series, you could just imagine what it could do for your marriage. Tonight's you is for the Refuah Shlema of Rav Ephraim ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sarah bat Anat, um, Itamar ben Sarah, Rabbanit Levana bat Sarah, Avimori David ben Esriah, Imimorati Doris bat Jora, Sarah bat Esther, and all of Am Israel and all the righteous Noahais that continue to learn with us, continue to support all the amazing things that the organization is doing. Thank you very much for everything that you're doing. Also, as a reminder for everybody, if you want some of our books uh, that are in Hebrew or the USBs that have our lectures on them in English uh, to distribute in your community in the United States, you can go to our uh, kiruvstore.org kiruvstore k-i-r-u-v-s-t-o-r-e dot org and you can get yourself some of those for free to distribute in your community only if it's Jewish people don't uh, you know order it if you're in the middle of uh, Montana and there's uh, you know three Jews uh, about 500 miles away from you uh, it's just simply not the uh, not the intention of the uh, of the campaign if you want to help us uh, distribute things, uh, whether it's in our Kiruv station, which Baruch Hashem has been uh, really uh, unbelievable over these last couple of months here in South Florida, uh, or the other projects that we have, you could donate on our website, Uh And uh, last but not least, we also have the new uh, store for you hardcore fans that want to get some uh, Be'ezrat Hashem uh, merch. You can go to uh, our... Um, our YouTube page, uh, or you can go to uh, bhshop.org and you can get some of the merch over there. The blanket is uh, a, a big favorite in my house. My kids love it. It's very comfortable. The bag is my favorite and, uh, and a few other things that are certainly uh, very cool over there. Uh, of course, aside from uh, the, uh, the cost of the products, which are very, which is very high, believe it or not. Uh, I know the, uh, uh, you guys are maybe surprised, but yeah, it's very high, <laughs> very expensive stuff. Uh, but whatever is left of it uh, is contributed to the organization, so it turns your purchase into a mitzvah because uh, that uh, comes to the organization so we could use to help Am Yisrael get closer to the Torah. Uh, so with that being said, we're going to get started with this series and continue uh, in uh, something that uh, has really uh, transformed our minds transformed our souls, transformed our uh, bodies over this uh, last 30 or so lectures because uh, the Ramban, uh, when he wrote this 750 years ago, 
he didn't just write it for uh, his Talmud. Uh, back then, he even writes it himself that uh, this is something that uh, could affect any person that would ever read it, uh, whether Jew or Noahide. Uh, and he even mentioned that later on in the, uh, in the book. And in fact, it's something that uh, could truly transform your marriage, your relationship, your mindset, and ultimately your servitude of Hashem. If you watch the lectures, you could uh, literally transform your entire life uh, just like our dear student uh, Eli said in his uh, podcast that we had on, on Motzei Shabbat. Uh, this uh, is his favorite series, uh, especially since the series is not necessarily uh, what, uh, what the average person expects or will ever hear anywhere else, not from experts, psychiatrists, or any other ist out there, uh, simply because the words of the sages are as holy as it can get. Uh, but that uh, also means that they have the highest level of wisdom. And uh, this wisdom that's in this uh, book, in this series in general, uh, has really uh, taken us uh, in a uh, completely different direction than we ever thought we were ever going to be on. And the beautiful part is that every single new segment is a completely new issue. So far, the Ramban has prepared us spiritually for that big holy act of intimacy. He also prepared us uh, psychologically for that big and ultimate act of intimacy, for that mikveh night. He also prepared us physically to make sure that we don't eat certain foods that can make uh, intimacy problematic, uh, to make sure that we know what to eat, when to eat. The diet is also very clear, uh, very critical. Uh, and uh, at the top of all of that, he also prepared us psychologically in a sense that he let us know last week that there are going to be major tests for all of these very dear tzaddikot, these dear Jewish women that are going to the mikveh each month. They have to know, and their husbands need to know, that it's never going to be easy, because if you do this right, you could literally bring the next Moshe Rabenu to the generation. If you do this right, you can bring such an extraordinary neshama to the world that literally it would bring light to the world. Now, of course... All of this is fantastic, but the average person out there is, if he hasn't heard these lectures, and he is or she is in a relationship, they are under the assumption that they know what love is and what intimacy is because they feel it. Yet the Chazonish famously said what people on the street call love, we call karit. Why would the Chazonish say such a blunt statement? The reason why is because most people base their love on something. And the Mishnah in Perkei Avot says that any relationship that's based on something is bound to end. When that something ends, that relationship ends. Meaning that if your love is dependent on how beautiful her face is and how big his bank account is and how uh, you know the, uh, the car is very nice and the neighborhood they live is good and the job is good, that relationship will eventually end. It will dissipate, it will deteriorate, it will eventually end. It's not going to succeed. And this also explains why the divorce rates uh, in Western society are so high. Yet if you look at history of Am Yisrael, you see that divorce rates are almost non-existent. They exist, and we're even going to mention one that's mentioned in the Gemara, but they're not very common. Usually, there are exceptional cases. Now, the uh, Anaf Etzavot by Arab Ovadi Yosef brings extraordinary stories about each Mishnah in the Masechet. And he brings <clears> the <throat> Talmud Yerushalmi Masechet Tubot in uh, section 11, Alacha number 3, about one of the Gdole Ador, one of the Gdole Ador, Rabbi Yossi Aglili. Rabbi Yossi Aglili was a, a giant among giants. But of course, as the Gemara says elsewhere, that a person that marries a uh, evil woman is, uh, gets his, uh, whatever difficulties he gets are in this world, and anything that he's done is a mistake, he meets a few sins, are erased already in this world and he won't suffer even a 1% in Gehenom. Why? Because an evil woman is literally living Gehenom in this world. Needless to say, an evil man. But Rabbi Yossi Aglili, like some other Chachamim, married an evil woman. 
And this woman tortured him left and right. She would embarrass him in public. She would literally do everything and anything possible just to torture the guy. Now, you're talking about one of the G'dolei Adol, Tzadik, Kodesh Kodeshim. But yet, this woman had it out for him. Why she married him? Apparently, she likes, she's a, uh, one of those people that likes to torture people. And she would do everything possible just to torture him. He wants, uh, you know, a, a beans to eat, she'll give him noodles. He wants noodles, she'll give him beans. He wants up, she wants down. He wants to go, she wants to stay. Everything the opposite. You know, sometimes you have relationships like this and people say, no, no, it's just that we're opposites. That why? No, no, it's because you don't love each other. That's why. Because you don't love each other. Why? Because a woman that loves her husband is going to do whatever the husband wants her to do. A man that loves his wife is going to want to, is going to do whatever the wife wants to do, so long as it's within the grounds of Torah. Now, of course, in the secular world, they have no concept of what love is, and we're going to get to that in a second and prove that. And in fact, many of you, if not all of you, that are watching today are going to admit to yourself that you did not know what love is until today. In fact, once you hear what the Ramban is about to teach us, you're going to start asking yourself if you've ever felt love at all. Especially for those that think, oh, I love God. You know, everybody wants to love God. I don't want to fear God. I want to love God. Fine. You want to love God? You first have to know what love is. And this is not an insult. This is an education. The whole point of all of these shiurim is to educate ourselves and re-educate ourselves. We educate ourselves with this Torah, but we also have to re-educate ourselves to overcome the ego that makes us think that we know much more than we do. So Rabbi Oseg Lili was married to a wicked woman, a woman that literally tortured him. And one day, Rabbi Lazar ben Azaria, one of the other gedolim, one of the other tzaddikim in the generation, came to visit him to learn some Torah with him. And he, he witnessed how Rabbi Oseg Lili's wife is insulting him, is abusive, it's horrible. He pulls him to the side. He says, Kvodo cannot continue such a marriage. Surely someone with, uh, with, 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 in your caliber should not be married to such a woman. Now, obviously, you know that nobody gets involved into anybody's marriage, needless to say the holy sages, but if this actually happened, you can see that there was certainly grounds for it. He's telling him, you cannot be married to this woman. This is a woman that is a desecration of the Torah. Rabbi Yossi says to him, what could I do? The sum of money that I promised her on the Ktuba is too much for me to afford. I can't divorce her. I can't afford it. Rabbi Lazar ben Azaria was very wealthy. The Gemara says that he literally owned cities, cities and boats, an enormous amount of money, something that's incomprehensible even in today's terms. He says, I'll pay for it. Rabbi Yossi says to them, if you're going to pay for it, Certainly, I will do it. And that's what happened. He gave him the money. He gave it to the woman. And they parted ways. She quickly got married to uh, some other uh, rich guy that was a shomer, that was like a guy that's uh, in charge and a powerful person. And uh, he moved on with his life. And, of course, remarried and did everything. Went on. A few years passed. And his uh, ex-wife's life went downhill. The new husband made a few bad mistakes in business and lost all of his money. His health deteriorated and he lost his vision. And now him and his wife had to go from door to door collecting tzedakah, collecting charity. They went from street to street, door to door, Please, Tzaka, help us, please, help us, please. And after going through all of the streets, it wasn't enough. Her husband asked her, did you uh, take us to every street? She says, to be honest with you, I didn't. There's one street we didn't go to. Why not? Well, that's because my ex-husband, Rabbi Osiyag Lili, he lives there. And... I treated him so bad. I tortured him so much. I'm embarrassed to go and knock on his door and ask him for help. 
As they're saying this, Rabbi Yossi Agri is passing by and he overhears the conversation. And all of a sudden he appears to them. He says, oh, hi, how are you? Hey, I haven't seen you in a long time. I hope you guys are doing very well. Listen, I don't know where, where you guys are right now, but I have an extra house I'm not doing anything with. Would you, uh, would you want to live there maybe? Maybe it's good for you guys maybe to live here instead of where you live? They said, uh, yeah, sure, of course, yeah, we, we, we actually were looking for a place, so yeah, this would fit. How much? No, no, it's free, don't worry. Free? Free is the best price. And not only did he give him the rent free to live in the house, but he gave them money to live week after week, month after month for the rest of their lives. When we talk about G'dolei Ado, when we talk about the giant Chachamim, the sages of yesteryear, and needless to say, the sages of today, we're talking about people that act accordingly. Accordingly meaning according to the highest level of Chassidut, the highest level of Tzadikut, the highest level of loving of Hashem and His people. Things that are completely abnormal. Today, you have people that were married for 10, 20 years, had kids together and decided they want to part ways and then they spent the next 20 years fighting in court in order to express how much they hate each other. He wants more than she's getting. She wants him to be left with nothing. He doesn't want to give her a get. She doesn't want to do this. And they fight and torture each other. And they literally embarrass each other in public. They post things on the internet. Literally, one divorce after another, one chilul Hashem after another. They were married for 10, 20 years, have kids together, but now everyone has to suffer, not just them. The kids have to suffer, the grandkids have to suffer, the community has to suffer, the rabbis have to suffer. Everybody has to suffer. Why? Because they never knew what love is to begin with. They never knew what love is to begin with. They knew lust. They thought it's love. And sadly, Rabotai, most people today and by most, I mean the overwhelming majority of society, 99.999% of people in the world today have no concept of what love truly is. When the Chazonish said his statement of what people call love, we call karet, it's because he was saying that people think that when you have a physical attraction to somebody, and therefore that stimulates certain emotions, which leads to certain actions, whether you're married or not, whether it's allowed or not, that's karet. That's a sin that separates you from God. And unless a person does tshuva, it's a permanent separation. Love, on the other hand, is an act that unites you with somebody in a way that's beyond your imagination. Why? Because it requires your imagination and more. So now the, the Ramban is going to elaborate on this. He's going to elaborate on this and Be'ezat Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will help us to clarify what he's saying. And last week he told us that Rabbi Yochanan would go in the, and sit in the front of the mikveh and think about HaKadosh Baruch Hu, cleave to Hashem and to the upper worlds that Hashem has in order to create a certain level of kedusha, a certain level of holiness, so that when anyone would look at him, when any uh, women would look at him, they would benefit from this holiness and bring that home with them and create holy children. Rav Eliyahu Bar Shalom says that the Ramban is revealing to us here that by connecting our thoughts to a tzaddik, who is himself adhering his thoughts to the Shekhinah, we ourselves connect to the Shekhinah. Where did he get this from? From the Torah. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to us that it's a mitzvah to cleave on to him. But the Gemara says, how can we cleave on to Hashem? He's a burning fire. He says, by cleaving on, by grabbing on to the Talmidei Chachamim, by supporting them, by learning with them, 
by doing everything we possibly can with them, we're cleaving onto Hashem. Now, of course, a person has to know who is a Talmud Chacham and who is a Amaaretz, ignoramus, heretic, which we discussed in a different lecture earlier this week. But either way, Rabbi Ochanan would allow the public to benefit from his holiness. And now the Ramban is going to allow us to benefit from his holiness. And he says as follows, I will inform you about another matter regarding thought. Although it's not part of the intention of this book, it is nevertheless useful to you and others. This is that when the Hasidim, meaning the ones from the Gemara, the Tzadikim from the 2,000 years ago, when they would adhere their thoughts to the upper realms, everything they thought about and intended at that time was manifested, whether for good or for bad. This is what our sages said in the Gemara, Maser Baba Kabatra, page 75a, he put a gaze, uh, uh, he put, uh, uh, he gazed his eyes upon him and he became a heap of bones. We'll elaborate in a moment. And they also said in Masechet Ta'anit, concerning the young woman who due to our great beauty, men would go to great efforts to look at her. So our father said, my daughter, you are the source of trouble to mankind. Return to your earth. And she did. She died. Our sages also said in Masechet Chagiga, every place where the sages cast their glance in judgment, it caused death or poverty. Related to this matter is the subject of prayer and sacrifice, which is the secret of adhering to the heavenly realms. Up to here is what we're going to, Bezot Hashem, cover, elaborate, and Bezot Hashem, pull out the holiness from there in the terms that we could understand and apply Bezot Hashem. When Rabbi Yochanan would think about a Kadosh Baruch Hu, connect his mind to the upper worlds, we discussed how a person that understands how the upper worlds work, how they look like, he knows what to do when he gets there. And therefore, his mind which thereby means him, because wherever your mind is is where you are, goes into a new level, a new realm of reality. A reality where what we consider miraculous here is normal behavior there. And therefore, whatever he is thinking about, good or bad, there is manifested into reality here. Why? Why does this work this way? And what does this all have to do with love? The average person, if you ask them, what's on your mind? You had a study. You were in the street, you know, like some people, they uh, make these uh, videos where they walk up to different strangers, people they don't know, in universities, in different streets where it's busy, and ask people different questions. Usually, it's because they want to highlight the level of stupidity in society today because the average uh, college uh, uh, student doesn't even know, um, you know, who the president is, who the vice president is, who was the first president. Needless to say, they don't know how many... Jewish countries are in the world, and if there was one time a study done where they asked kids in, uh, I believe it was UCLA, a school that cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $50,000 per year, which if you ask me is a complete waste of money, uh, most of the education is unnecessary, and the one that you're actually getting, you could literally learn for free on the internet. But nonetheless, if somebody needs a degree for a specific profession, Taking certain courses may be worthwhile, but no, no need for you to actually attend these types of schools. You could do it all online. But anyway, back to our issue at hand. They asked these kids, these kids that their parents or the government uh, is paying 50000 or more a year to attend the school. And they're asking him a basic question. 
how many Jewish people are in the world, in your opinion, and how many Jewish countries are in the world, versus how many Muslim people are in the world, and how many Muslim countries are there. And literally, it was if it was if it was a comedy skit, it would actually be funny. But since it wasn't, it's not. The average person said that they believe that there are literally billions of Jews in the world and dozens of Jewish countries. But in regards to the Muslims, they believe that there is only a few million Muslims in the world and perhaps one or two Muslim countries. I mean, as far from the truth as you can possibly get, the exact opposite almost, as there's only one Jewish country and there's only... 15 million, at most 20 million Jewish people that we know of. Whereas the Muslims, there's over 2 billion Muslims in the world and there are a couple of dozen Muslim countries. But your average student that's going to spend at least a quarter million dollars in tuition fees does not know this. They ask people who the vice president is, they have no concept. They ask people... Who their mayor is, they have no concept. Now again, if you ask your average yeshiva bachu the same questions, they may not know either who the mayor is, but that's because they're in the world of Torah, where these things are not relevant as far as who the mayor is and who the president is. Perhaps today, maybe some people do know. But when you have people taking political, cl- uh, political science as a major and all types of you know, secular subjects, that's their life, they don't know these things, You're asking yourself, what do you actually do here other than party? So certainly, asking people a question sometimes is just for comedy. Sometimes it's sad, but funny. But if you ask the average person in the street, what are you thinking about? Your average person would typically be embarrassed to tell you. And if they told you, they'll tell you something silly. Like, I'm thinking about my car. I'm thinking about the car I want. I'm thinking about some girl. I'm thinking about some boy. I'm thinking about what I'm going to eat for lunch. I'm thinking about a new recipe. Usually something tangible, physical. Rarely will you ever find somebody that's thinking anything beyond that. Unfortunately, even if you go into the religious world, the Jewish world, and you ask the average bachu, the average guy out there, what are you thinking about right now? If they're not in yeshiva. Many times they'll say something somewhat similar. Once in a while they'll tell you something surprising and in a very good news where they're thinking about some sugya they learned about, they're thinking some Torah, which is fantastic. But rarely are you going to find the answer that we need. We need to think. When we talk about these tzaddikim in the Gemara, we're talking about people that, as the Ramban is bringing here, are people that were able to connect their mind to the upper worlds. Even the comic books were not able to do something similar. Because everything that the secular world can do is only connected to what it's familiar with, which is physicality. And the Ramban says that here you have different tzaddikim, dozens and dozens of them mentioned in the Gemara, published approximately 1,600 years ago, where they would adhere their thoughts to the upper heavens and everything that they thought about manifested. One of the examples he gives is Rabbi Yochanan. When the Gemara in Masechet Baba Batra, page 75a, says that Rabbi Yochanan was teaching one day. And he was teaching a shiur about what will be at the time of Mashiach. How the world will be. And one of the things that will happen after the Mashiach arrives, after he defeats all of the enemies, the war is over, 
will be the building of the Bet Mikdash. This is one of the reasons why you know the Mashiach has not arrived. Not once and not ever. When he arrives, the whole world will know. There will, only, there will not be any disputes. There will not be any disagreements. Just like Mount Sinai is not disagreed upon by anyone, even the heretics that hate Judaism do not disagree with Mount Sinai. Needless to say, the two other religions in the world, such uh, Christianity and their many versions that they have in Islam, all agreed that Mount Sinai happened. No one disagrees with it. The Mashiach, as it's the climatic event throughout the whole, since the world's creation, certainly will not be any less. Hence the reason why no one will disagree when he finally does arrive. So Rabbi Yochanan is teaching this, and he says that after he defeats the enemies, after he destroys them, after all idolatry is removed from the world, in fact, the idol worshippers themselves will destroy their own places of idolatry. They will blow them up, as the prophet says. After all that said and done, the Bet Mikdash will come down from heaven, and you'll see beauty that the world has never seen before. And he gives the students an illustration of what it would look like. And when he gets to the gates of the Bet Mikdash, Rabbi Yochanan says that the gates, the doors of the Bet Mikdash will be enormous diamonds. Not a whole set of diamonds, but huge boulders that are actual diamonds. Shiny, the brightest diamond, perfect, flawless, enormous. Each one, exactly the same as the other. 40 feet in the air, something unbelievable. One of the students didn't care for this so much. He said, ah, the Rebbe is exaggerating. How could there be? Such big diamonds, when today we don't even have a diamond that's the size of an egg. You're talking about not one, but two enormous diamonds that are perfect and flawless and that big? The Rebbe is exaggerating. You know, it's like the people of today that say, don't believe anything that the Midrash says. You don't have to take it seriously. It's all a parable. It's all analogy. It's all this. It's all that. It's fairy tales. Same type of thing. So this student disregarded what the Rebbe said. He didn't make a public statement or a YouTube video to tell people that he doesn't believe. He felt it in his heart. Akadosh Baruch can see your heart. And one day, the student was on a ship and the ship hit something, cratered, Everyone's in the ocean, including this young man. As he goes under the water, miracle of miracles. He opens his eyes as he's under the water and he sees angels working at the bottom of the ocean on two enormous diamonds. And apparently he was able to speak to them as obviously Hashem set this whole thing up and he asked them, what is this? And they told this young man, these are the future doors. The doors of the future Bet HaMikdash. We're working on them. We're preparing them. He gets out of the water, saved obviously for a purpose. He comes back to shore. He goes back to the Bet Midrash, where Rabbi Yochanan would teach. And he attends a shiur. Rabbi Yochanan is talking about something else altogether. And he mentions something similar that's exaggerated in the eyes of the people that don't like to believe the words of the sages because it doesn't make rational sense to them. And the young man says, Yeah, Rabbi, Drash, Rash, what you say is emet. I saw it. This abrupt interruption by this Bachur, the Rebbe says to him, what do you mean? 
it's true what I say. What, what are you talking about? Obviously, he knows what he says is true. What do you mean? What, what, what is this? He says, no, last time I came to a shoe, you said about the future Bet Mikdash having these enormous doors that were diamonds and, 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 and they were huge and perfect. And you know what? To be honest, you I, had a, I didn't believe it. We don't have a diamond that's even the size of an egg. And you're saying there's going to be such doors. I saw these things, though. Hashem showed me these doors. Now, instead of being impressed by this young man and how Hashem made a miracle for him to see such a thing, Rabbi Ochanan said, Huh? You don't believe the words of the Chachamim? As he finished this statement, the young man died on the spot and turned into a heap of bones in front of everybody. Word spread all over the news. We're not sure what happened, but apparently one of the people in the yeshiva of Rabbi Yochanan has turned into bones. More investigation coming soon. Why did this happen? Why did such a thing happen? Further, the Ramban brings another story, which of course we're going to explain all of them eventually. We're in the Gemara Masechet Tani, page 24a. Fantastic, beautiful Masechet. If you haven't studied the Shas, I recommend starting with Masechet Brachot, and after that, go to Masechet Tanit. It's full of extraordinary stories in addition to beautiful Torah. That is not just stories, but some of the best stories you're ever going to hear are in there in Masechet Tanit. There's like literally a whole segment of stories about Rabbi Hanina and many others. Anyway, in there is a story about one of the other tzaddikim, Rabbi Yosei of Yokeret. Rabbi Yosei of Yokeret was Kodesh Kodeshim, and he had a beautiful daughter. And one day, as Rabbi Yosei ben Yokeret is walking towards his house, he sees that there is one of the Bachurim, from the yeshiva, peeking through his fence. There was some type of shade covering it, and he made a little hole to peek through the fence. He says to him, Bni, my son, what are you doing? He says, oh, what can I do, Rabbi? Uh, You know, if I couldn't marry her, then at least I want to look. Who is he talking about? Rabbi Yossi's daughter. Why? She was so beautiful that the guy wasn't even embarrassed about the fact that he wants to look at her, even to her own father. She said, I can't marry her, I know. It's not, I'm not, but at least I want to see, I want to enjoy the beauty. What can I do? Rabbi Yossi goes into his house, he sees his daughter, and he says to her, my dear daughter, your beauty is a source of trouble for Am Yisrael. You're causing Am Yisrael to sin because of how beautiful you are. Return to the dust you came from. On the spot, his daughter turned to sand. News spread in the world of Torah. Beautiful daughter of Rabbi Yossi has turned into a little ball of sand. Why? What happened? One of the Talmidim of Rabbi Yossi heard about this and he ran away from the rabbi. They asked him, why are you coming here? Your, your, your rabbi is the biggest rabbi in the world. He goes, yeah, he's the biggest rabbi in the world, but I'm scared of death of him. Why? If I get the wrong answer, if I sue, sue something, he may turn me into a little 
bowl of potatoes. I don't know, bowl of uh, sand, bowl of something. I don't want, I'm scared. He's too holy for me. He ran away to a different, he started learning from one of the different chachamim. So he's too high for me. I'm scared. I don't trust myself. If he is like this with his own daughter, what about me? What about me? What's he gonna do to me? The Gemara in Masechet Haya, page five B, that the Ramban is bringing, says it became well known throughout all of the Jewish communities that had the sages among them that everywhere that the sages would look at in judgment it would either bring death or poverty meaning they saw something that's against God didn't have to scream yell put pishkevilim all over the walls make YouTube videos ranting and yelling no no simple they saw something that's against the will of Hashem something bad happened everybody became poor someone died people were scared to death to do anything wrong why Chas v'shalom, one of the sages looks at you who knows if you're gonna survive the day forget about survive the year you survive the minute in fact, the Gemara in Masechet Abu Dazara has a famous story where one of the Roman Caesars passed a decree against Am Yisrael as they usually did. And Am Yisrael needed a miracle to get this overturned. They said, we need to send somebody that miracles are normal to him. Send Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai Miracles are normal to him. He said, yeah, but Rabbi Shimon cannot go by himself. Someone has to go with him. Ooh, who would go with him? Rabbi Yossi's son said, no, I'll go, I'll go. In front of everybody. His father's like, oh, why did you say that? Ay, ay, ay. Why did you say that? Why? Why, my dear son? Why didn't you ask me first? Why? Well, I want to go with the tzaddik. I want to go. His father almost started crying. Rabbi Yosef, one of the Gdolei Adar, his son. He almost started crying because his son is going to go on a trip with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Today, everybody sings, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, everybody thinks they're his best friend. The father, Rabbi Yosef, one of the Gdolei Adar, one of the Talmudim of Rabbi Akiva, almost cried when he found out that his son is about to take a trip with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Why? He says, you don't understand, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is Kodesh Kodeshim. It's Kodesh Kodeshim. You do one thing, one thing against the will of God, you're going to die on a spot. One thing you do against the will of God, you'll turn into bones. The dogs will eat you. He was scared to send them. Until Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai found out, he said, no, no, worry. I promise you, I'll bring him back. I promise you, I'll bring him back. So here you have Tzadikim, that an extraordinary powers it would seem like. And these types of powers, these types of abilities, scared the people. Certainly they helped the people. When Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai went on the way, one of the demons came to him, a demon by the name of Talmalion, Initially, Rabbi Shimon started crying, says, look, look how lowly we are. The servant of our forefather, Avraham, Hagar, she had two angels come to her. We have a demon. Look how lowly we are. Look how much of a nothing we are. Oh, to woe to us. Some people today, they look for demons because they think it's cool until they find them. Rabbi Shimon is crying that a demon came to help him. Came to work, work for him. He's crying. He's like, ah, well, how lowly we are. Because we don't have angels like Avraham Avinu's uh, servant, Hagar. Anyway, 
Since you're already here, he says to him, go do something for me. Of course, Rabbi Shimon, at your command, go to the Caesar's house and enter the, he has a daughter. Enter her. It's a dibuk. Make her go crazy. But when I come, I tell you to leave, you get out. At your service, Rabbi Shimon. The demons were scared of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. He goes, they get to the palace of the Caesar. Of course, by the time they get there, there's commotion. Everyone is crying. Everyone is scared. No one knows what's happened to the daughter of the Caesar. He brought all of the scientists and philosophers and experts and doctors. No one knows what to do. No one knows what to do with this kid that's bending her body in all types of strange shapes, climbing the walls. You know, like, you know, the, the exorcist. Nightmare. Rabbi Shimon enters. Now, typically, the Romans didn't like the Jews. But here, there's desperation. They don't have time to not to like the Jews. What do you want? says, I heard that the uh, Caesar's daughter is not feeling well. Uh, I can help. The Caesar heard this. You can do it. Said, sure. Right away. No problem for me. If you can do it, I'll give you whatever you want. No problem. He went into the room. The girl was there. He whispered, Tamayon, out. Got out. Ta-da! Mazel tov. She's back to normal. Normal reshait as she was without the demon. Of course, the Caesar is happy. Whatever you want, it's yours. Go into my treasure chest. Pick whatever you want. They go into the treasure chest. Some say that it was actually in the tunnel under where the Vatican is today. Over there, they still to this day have many, many of the Jewish treasures that they've stolen over the centuries, including the Kelim of the Bet HaMikdash, the menorah. Over there, Rabbi Shimon says that he actually saw the menorah, he saw the, the, uh, the uh, what um, Titus Imach Shimov stole. Anyway, the uh, subject debate among the sages about how the menorah actually looked like Part of the uh, sources of how one of the opinions uh, is how it looked like is actually based on this particular story of what Rabbi Shimon actually saw. And that's contradicting what is on the uh, in a, a, a monument that was built in Rome that you can see till this day where you see the Jews are carrying the menorah where it has a different bottom. Where some say it was, you know, it was a square bottom but uh, others say it was a uh, bottom that was like a uh, tripod. It's a machloket. Anyway, when the Rabbi Ponovich came to Rome to collect money for his dear yeshiva, he asked the uh, driver to take him to this monument, to the place where Titus had his big celebration. They built him a whole monument celebrating how he destroyed the Bet HaMikdash. And it's up until this day, 2,000 years later. Rami Ponovich got out of the car, looked at the monument, and said, Titus, Titus, where are you? We are still here. And he got it back into the car and left. Titus wanted to destroy the Jewish people, just like all of the other enemies of Am Yisrael. We're here. Where are they? So, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was Kodesh Kodeshim. The demons were scared of him. People were scared of him. These are the types of sages we have in our Gemara. Now, the Ramban is telling us here that these types of things were happening regularly. And this is something we can learn from. But what can we learn from this, though? You look at somebody, you may get slapped. They're not going to turn into anything. 
They look at you. You're going to ask them, what are you looking at? So what is it going to do for you? This, other than entertain you. Well, Rabutai, that's why the Ramban is here. To let us know there's an enormous amount of Torah and we must learn it. Shlomo Amelech says that people do not understand what Ava is, what love is. Why? Because people think that they love God when they don't really know what love is. They don't really know what love is. He says in Mishle, in Proverbs, in chapter 27, verse uh, 19, as water reflects a face back to a face, so one's heart is reflected back to him by another. Kamayim apanim lapanim ken leva adam laadam. As water reflects a face back to a face, so one's heart is reflected back to him by another. Chachamim explained that when there is love, you don't have to talk about it. Why? It's known. Because a person's attitude and emotion when facing water are reflected back to him, it's just like facing water, it's reflected back to him, meaning that when somebody loves another person, those, if it's real love, those feelings for that other person are known by the other person and actually create a reciprocating love. Because as the Baal Mitzudot says, if a person loves his fellow, his fellow Jew, or person loves his spouse, it's going to show and it's going to influence the other to love them back. But when you have something superficial, something based on physicality, something based on money, looks, etc., you're also going to know if you know how to tell what real love is. Why? Because the loyalty that you're going to get from these types of people is temporary. Because at the moment, moment it's be, it gets tested, you'll see the weakest link. Some people say they love another person. You're my best friend. I love you. You're this. I love this one. They say all types of things. But in reality, sometimes they actually don't like the person. Some actually feel that they have uh, real love and, and, and kingship between them and somebody else. But it ends at some point. They ask their friend for a favor. And as soon as they ask for a favor, all of a sudden the friend is busy. Or they can't do it. Or you ask them for something that literally is easy for them to do. They just simply don't want to do it. They don't want to be bothered. Why? You're disturbing them. They liked you when you were strong. Now you're showing signs of weakness. I'm going to find a new friend. Come back when you're strong again. Yeah, but you said you're my best friend. You said you loved me. You said we this. You said we that. So I said, I felt it back then. I don't know, something changed. What changed? I didn't do anything. I don't know. Maybe it's not you, it's me. You know, all that nonsense that people say to each other in order to make themselves feel better. Shlomo Amedek says that if a person truly loves another, it's going to be just like when a person faces water. You're going to be able to see it. But why doesn't he use the comparison to, let's say, a mirror? 
says Rabbi Yosef Kimchi, is because a mirror, even if you're far away from it, you can still see yourself. You can still see somebody else, even if it's not as close. Water, on the other hand, the reflection is only visible if you're close. As soon as you step away, it disappears. In order for something to be truly love, you have to get really close. It can't be love from afar. Can't be far from the person, but say you love them. Can't be, uh, I love you, but I have a girlfriend. I love you, but uh, I cheat on you. I love you, but I'm not honest with you. No such thing. You love yourself. And you're enjoying the benefits you get from this person. And you want them to feel good about it, so you call it love. Now, Shlomo Melech says we have no idea what love is. Why? Because what we think is love usually requires all types of bells and whistles. When in reality, real love is something that requires you to get really, really close. But what does it mean to get really close? What does it mean to get really close? The Chachamim, they spent their entire waking hours thinking about HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So when somebody does something like a aliyat neshama, which is they take their soul out of their body and bring it up to the heavens, or they are doing all types of kavanot, and like Rabbi Yochanan was doing, like the other Chachamim we mentioned were doing, they knew their way around. They were familiar enough with the upper heavens where they knew where to go, what to do, because they were constantly thinking about Hashem. There wasn't a moment where they weren't thinking about Hashem. And therefore, the moment their mind thinks of something specific while they're there, they're in the upper worlds, it comes to existence, whether good or bad, because they're now, their mind is in front of the king of kings who wants to fulfill their will. The... Evan Ezel says about Psalm number 16, verse 8, where David Melech says, Shiviti Hashem lenegdi tamid, that I have Hashem before me always, because He's at my right hand and I shall not falter. Shiviti Hashem lenegdi tamid, kimimeni balemot. The Evan Ezel says that David Melech is telling us that he has gone to a point where his soul is constantly connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, even though he's still alive. Because the average person tries to do something that's bigger than him, such as elevate his soul, elevate his mind to such high, high, high levels. They could literally die. They could go crazy. They could do a lot of different things, but that are not positive. David Amela says he's already at a standard where he's constantly thinking about Hashem in the highest possible levels, even though he's still alive. The Magid of Rabbi Yosef Karo, the angel that Rabbi Yosef Karo had in the Sefer Magid Mesharim, he writes that one time Rabbi Yosef Karo was finishing prayer and all of a sudden his tefillin on the head broke like a rip, like as if somebody cut it and fell on the floor. Of course, this brought him a lot of sorrow. Your tefillin fall on the floor. It's not a good thing. It's not a good, uh, not a good way to start the day. Let's just say that. Later that day, when the angel came to him, he said, you're sad. Rabbi Yosef Kawa said, yes, I'm very sad. 
He says, because your tefillin fell off today. He said, yes. He says, do you know why that happened? Rabbi Yosef Kawa says, don't know. I was hoping you could tell me. And then the Magid says to him, I did it. What? You did it? Yeah, I did it. I cut your tefillin. Because there was a moment, there was a moment where you did not think about Hashem and I had to wake you up immediately. I had to awaken you, arouse you. So I cut your tefillin. Meaning that the level of Kedusha, of holiness that was expected from Rabbi Yosef Karo was not something that's normal to us. Thinking about Hashem. You ask an average person, what are they thinking about? They're thinking about cookies. They're thinking about, I don't know, some Game Boy, some PlayStation. They're thinking about the stock market. They're thinking about food. They're thinking about something that's forbidden to think about. They're thinking about everything but Hashem. Sometimes even while they're praying and while they're studying, they're not thinking about Hashem. Rabbi Yosef Karo didn't think about Hashem for a moment. The Magid punished him. Why? I had to arouse you in order to get you out of that flaw of not thinking about Hashem for a moment. So if you want an angel, now you know how to get it. You have to think about Hashem constantly. Now, what does all of this have to do with love? These sages, these stories. The Mishnah in Perkei Avot says, "Batela davar, batla ava." The moment that a love that is dependent on something, some physicality, you like the way her face looks, you like the different things about him. The moment those things that you like disappear. So does that feeling of love that you had. Why? Because you never had love to begin with. You had something that resembles it. You had something that looks like it, sounds like it, but it's not it. So what is real love? Real love, Rabotai, is a pure emotion that comes from the depths of the soul that is not dependent on anything physical. Akadosh Baruch Hu created man. As the Torah says in Sefer Bereshit, the book of Genesis, that he blew into him a living soul. A Kadosh Baruch Hu blew into Adam, into this body that came from the dust of the four corners of the world and had the traits of all of the animals in creation. Each one gave him something. And now, Hashem put life into it. He put a soul into it. When that spiritual soul is awakened by another spiritual soul, it's thereby moved by this other soul like a pair of magnets. And therefore, real love is a feeling that reaches the depths of the heart that nullify all dependency on physical desires and attachments. Why? Because real love is a spiritual status. It's not a belief. It's not an idea. It's something that's within the person, their soul, connects to another soul 
to such an extent that they move together. They cannot separate. There is no separation. They're naturally thinking about each other all the time. Even if there's no plan or connection, everything is connected. The thing that this resembles the most in the creation, and perhaps part of the purpose of why this was created, was a magnet. Magnets. Why were magnets created? You could say magnets are useful for a lot of things, but in reality, Hashem created the creation in order for us to learn from that creation. Now, if you have two different magnets that are obviously have the opposites and so on, they attract each other, and as soon as they get close to each other, if there's nothing separating them, immediately they connect. If there's something in between them, let's say you have a table or whatever it is between them, when you move one magnet, what happens to the other magnet? It also moves. When you move it again, what happens to it? It moves again. No matter how many times you move it, it continues moving along with it. What's making it move? You can use all of the scientific terms you want. Oh, it's because of electromagnetic and this and that. Fine. Reality is, you have no idea. Why? Akadash Baruch Hu decided to create it that way. He decided that this magnet is going to move that magnet. That's why it works. You could explain it in natural physical terms, but the real reason is, Akadash Baruch Hu wants it to do that way. The same concept with the souls. When they are connected, when there is real love between them, there is nothing that one can do without it affecting the other. Out, not affecting the other. It moves, the other one moves. It thinks, the other one thinks. It feels, the other one feels. It is like what Shlomo HaMedach says, it is like looking at the water. You move, the reflection on the water moves. You move the other way, the reflection on the water the moves. If the reflection is not moving, it's because a demon. But if it's moving, it's love. So now, Shlomo HaMelech wants to tell us even more. He wants to tell us, how do you know you have love? Proverbs, chapter 10, verse 12 says Val kol peshaim love covers all transgressions when there is love between two people even if one person seriously wrongs the other it'll be overlooked why i love her too much so what if she didn't cook so what if she doesn't look like this? So what if she doesn't do this? So what? It doesn't make a difference. It's not considered. Separation is not part of the equation. If you thought about divorce, really? That means you don't really have love. You have something, but it's not love. Why? Because separation is not an option when love exists. There is no future that you can see yourself without this other person. If you're imagining yourself with someone else, that means you more likely love yourself, are expressing emotions and words that represent emotions to this other person that you're with, but it's not love. Why? Love means wherever I go, my lover goes. There is no 
reality without them. There's no future. There's no nothing. You fail to even remember a life without them. It's as if you weren't born yet. And that's why the Baal Shem Tov says extraordinary musal about love. He says, when Shlomo HaMelech tells us that love covers all transgressions, he's also hinting to us that love really can only be felt by those who cover themselves, those who are modest. Why? Because people that are not modest are not modest because they're arrogant, because they want the world to look at them. And they're too busy loving themselves in order to give and leave any room for love of anybody else aside from themselves. The more immodest you, mo- you are, the more incapable you are of loving anyone but yourself. The more immodest you tell your wife to be, the more you're telling her not to love you. Why? Because you're telling her to love herself and connect herself to a physical self. And in fact, the more you don't love her because you love the way she looks, this body, this dust that came into being because Hashem put a soul into it for some time. So here, a person has to understand that this pure emotion that comes from the depths of your soul is not going to be awakened just because. It's not going to be awakened all the time just because you've reached a certain age. Oh, I'm 20 years old. I'm 22 years old. I'm 25 years old. I still haven't found the one to get married to. Okay. And? Well, I want to get married. Good. Oh, Hashem, you want to get married. At least you're not one of those people that doesn't want to get married. Well, yeah, but I haven't found it. You will. When are we going to find it? When Hashem decides you're going to find it. But what are we going to do until then? Pray. And use all of those feelings that you want to give this future spouse of yours. Use all of it to feel for Hashem. To love Hashem. To fear Hashem. Why? Ah, that, now you're asking. Why you should do it? Why you should love HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Why you should fear HaKadosh Baruch Hu? That's a good question. The reason why is because David the Melech, Shlomo Melech's father, says in Tehilim, Retzon Yere'av Yase, that Akadosh Baruch Hu fulfills the wishes of those who fear him. This is in Psalm 145, verse 19. Retzon Yere'av Yase, Ve'et Shabbata Mishma V'yoshiyem. That a Kadosh Bahu fulfills the wishes of those who fear him, and he hears their cry and brings them salvation. When a person works on themselves and their relationship with a Kadosh Baruchu, and they utilize all of their emotions before they make a bracha on an apple, all of their emotions when they say Asher Yatzar. And they say, thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for my, making my body work. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that made me see. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for making me hear. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for allowing me to taste different tastes and not being like the snake that doesn't taste anything. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for putting money in my pocket. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for putting food in my belly. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for allowing my brain to work. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for giving me a job. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for allowing me to help people. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for allowing me to speak. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, 
for giving me all of the wonderful gifts that you give me every single second that I'm alive, even though I don't realize it. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for putting air in my lungs, even though I forgot it exists. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And you think of HaKadosh Baruch Hu about all the things you have, all of a sudden you fall in love with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Instead of crying, you're the happiest person in the world. Instead of being angry, you forgot anger exists. The reason why we get angry, the reason why we get sad, the reason why we get anything negative is because we are not dvekim le'akadosh baruch hu. We're not connected to akadosh baruch hu at that time. When we are not connected to akadosh baruch hu, how do you expect to be happy? How do you expect to be loving? How do you expect to do anything good? Do you know why akadosh baruch hu didn't send you the, the shiduch? Is because you're not ready. You're too focused on loving yourself. There's no room for you to love anybody else. He's doing you a favor by not sending you somebody else because if he sent them to you, you ruin it. Why? You're going to meet him and he's, you're going to forget that he's even there because you're going to be more focused about buying a dress or he's going to be more focused about buying a house and you're going to be more focused about some money that you don't have and you don't need and but you think you have and you think you need. And you're going to think about all types of imaginations. You're going to love the illusion of each other, but not each other. Why? You don't even know how to love Akadosh Baruch Hu. You think that you know how to love somebody else? The problem, Rabotei Karim, is that we spend so much of our emotions loving ourselves. There's no room for anybody else. Now, when you ask the average person, why are you crying? Oh, I'm sad. Why are you sad? Oh, because I'm fat. Oh, because I'm poor. Oh, because I'm this. Oh, because I'm that. Okay, but are you happy about the things that are good? No, because I'm too focused on being fat and I'm too focused on being poor. Okay, fine, but would you rather not be in the world? No, well, I'm not suicidal. Oh, so you're happier alive. Yeah, but I'm still fat. Okay, so you're fat and alive, so that means you eat a lot. Or you just have a poor sleeping pattern. Or you just eat too much junk food. Or whatever it is, but you're happy you're alive. So why don't you at least spend part of the day being happy that you're alive, and then after you finish expressing all of those emotions about being alive, if there's still some energy left to be sad about being fat or poor or whatever it is that you're sad about, go ahead and do it. But start off the day with the happy... And guess what? They'll never get to the side again. Why? Because all of a sudden they'll realize what they have in their hands and they'll say to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Thank you very much for giving me a life. And all of a sudden the pain they have doesn't matter so much. And all of a sudden the lacking they have doesn't matter so much. Why? Because they're too focused on loving HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And guess what happens when you love HaKadosh Baruch Hu? You start elevating your neshama to higher levels and all of a sudden you start feeling new emotions, having new thoughts, having new abilities that you never even knew existed. Now you're ready to show love to somebody else. Why? Because you finally know what love is. Until then, you're no different than a donkey or an ape. You love something that gives you something, meaning you desire it. It gives you comfort. If you give the monkey a banana, he's going to like you. You give him a banana every day, he's going to like you every day. You give a banana for three months in a row, guess what? You're going to be his favorite waiter. He's going to pretend like you're his master. He's going to pretend like you are you know, his mother. He's going to pretend a lot of things. Why are you giving him bananas? But the second you say to the monkey, no more banana, the monkey will turn you into a banana. All of a sudden doesn't like you. All of a sudden he hates you. And all of a sudden he wants to kill you. Why? Because the whole relationship with the monkey was based on a banana. Don't make your marriage based on a banana. Don't make your wife into a banana. Don't make your husband into a banana. You have to understand that in order for you to feel love for your spouse, you first have to understand what love is. Stop telling me or anybody else you love a Kadosh Baruch Hu. You don't even know what love is yet. Why? Because love is not dependent on anything material, anything physical. 
Love is a deep feeling that comes from the root of your neshama and moves alongside with what you love without any dependence on anything else. The moment that you are able to move your will alongside God's will, you want what God wants you to have. Not what your neighbors want you to have. Not what your cousins want you to have. Not what the Reshaim want you to have. Not what the lusts and the physicalities of the world and the desires of the world want you to have. You want what a Kadosh Baruch Hu wants you to have, which is good. Things that are permissible. So when you see things that are immoral, you see things that are against the Torah, even if your body craves it, your soul that loves HaKadosh Baruch Hu is disgusted by it. Why? I love Hashem. I love Hashem. Yeah, but the body wants. Let the body die for all I care. I love Hashem. When a person understands that his soul has to start moving in line with the will of Hashem, then they'll begin to know what love is. Now, it may be easy for some people to move their soul with another person rather than move their soul with their creator. But the point is still the same. When your thoughts are in line with their thoughts, not because you know what they're thinking, but rather because you know what is in their interest. You're thinking, you're desiring what is the best for them and not just for you. You're thinking, you're wanting what is the best thing for her, not just what's good for you. You're not just thinking about your beastly body and what your body needs. You're thinking about what does she want what does she need but more than anything else what would be good for her not based on my definition but based on who we are when a person starts determining their decisions based on a mutual interest now you have something that could be called love but if you are operating with separate minds and separate bank accounts and separate portfolios and separate houses and separate beds and separate vacations and separate futures that you don't tell each other about and sometimes even separate relationships that could be on the internet or even in reality. You do not have love of the other person. You simply have love of yourself. A love that of yourself that's so deep that it doesn't have any room for anybody else. It just has room for itself. You love yourself, so you want to soothe yourself. You want to soothe yourself with anything that would soothe it, whether it be food or some type of uh, intimate action, whatever it is. There are no bounds, there's no limitations to people that love themselves. But stop telling the other people that you love them because you're a liar. When a person feels real love, it changes their life. Because now they understand that there's something bigger than them. Most people are not going to know what love is when they first get married or even after a few years. The first time you start really feeling love for most people is when you have a kid. And the reason for that is because for the first time in your life, you'll realize that you are responsible for somebody else's breathing. Your whole life, nobody asked you how you're breathing. Your whole life, you never went next to somebody's bed and saw if they're breathing. But when you have a kid, all of a sudden you're worried. Is the kid breathing? I don't know, I can't hear him. Yeah, he's eight days old. What do you want him to do, snore? Oh, 
That's how it is with the kids? Yeah, 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 that's how it is with this. Oh, okay. Ten minutes later, is he okay? Yeah, he's sleeping. Oh, oh okay, he's sleeping. Does he say something? Yeah, probably in like six months from now. Oh, so it's going to be like this for six months? No, probably 60 years, but for now, for you, it's six months. Why? Well, for the first time in your life, you're seeing something. Now, if you don't know what love is, that love will be expressed at best just with the kid. If you do know what love is, all of a sudden, your heart grows more room for your wife. Why? She just gave you a gift you can never give her back. All of a sudden, you love your wife much more. Yeah, but what about the fact that she gained weight? What about the fact that she this? And what about the fact that she that? If it's love, none of those things actually matter. Because as we said, love is a spiritual status that comes from the depths of the soul. That when they're real, they eliminate any connection whatsoever to the physicality of the world. Meaning, you develop a connection with your wife, you develop a connection with your husband that no longer is ever concerned with the money in the accounts, with what house you live in, with what shoes you're able to buy, with how much weight you weigh or they weigh, and what you're going to eat for lunch, and what you're going to do for vacation. None of that actually matters anymore. In fact, the future doesn't exist unless they're there. The Gemara calls the wife bite. For any of you that know Hebrew, bite means house. Why does the Gemara call the wife bite? Why are all Jewish women fat? No. The opposite. If you love your wife, she's the house. Meaning, wherever she is, that's your home. If she's not there, I'm not home. I'm not home. When a person understands what love is, they'll understand that there is no more me. There's us. So when they hear stories of different chachamim that went to the doctor and they told the doctor, our leg hurts. The doctor says, whose leg hurts? The rabbi says, our leg hurts. Wait, so both of you have Pain in your leg? No. Her leg hurts. So why did you say our leg? Because it's our leg. Just like this arm is our arm. And this head is our head. And this house is our house. And this neshama is our neshama. Everything is ours. When her leg hurts, we're both in pain. When she doesn't feel good, we both don't feel good. When he doesn't feel good, we both don't feel good. Our leg hurts. If the moment your wife's leg hurts, or the moment your husband's head hurts, you run for the hills, it's nothing to be ashamed about. It's just that you don't love each other. You're not lacking care for each other as far as decent care as human beings you just don't love each other perhaps you should start working on it since you're married many times people think that love just works by itself love is just we had love at first sight there is no such thing there is certain souls that connect and are meant for each other that for sure but love is something that's expressed as the souls connect deeper with each other 
because of this united interest. This united interest that becomes a interest that simply is e inseparable. It's unseparated. Why? My interest becomes our interest. Our interest becomes our interest. Everything is our interest. The end. Or the beginning. So when a person has all types of imaginations in their future about being with other people, being at other places, wanting to be somewhere else where their spouse isn't, that's simply because they don't have love for the other person. They have love for themselves. So when you ask the average person, do you now understand the stories about the sages? Well, before you answer it, let's just clarify. Akadosh Baruch Hu says to David HaMelech, I will fulfill the will of those that fear me. Who fears HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Someone that's connected to him. When a person is constantly thinking about HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he's constantly going to be connected to him. He's constantly going to be in awe of him. Awe of how amazing the world he created is. Awe of how amazing his power is. Awe of how much control he has over my breathing, over my income, over my relationships, over my thoughts, over everything. The awe comes first. The fear of going against him comes first. But as a person develops that relationship and starts appreciating all of these things, he starts falling in love with Hashem as well. This takes time and an enormous amount of effort. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you don't have to wait until you completely love me. Because if you truly fear me, I'll already do what you want me to do. The lowest level of connection to God is fear of punishment. That is the very basic requirement. Without fear of punishment, there is no connection whatsoever with God. There is no such thing as loving God without fearing Him. It's simply not possible. Because if you love Him, that means you are at a much higher level, which includes all of the lower levels. The sages didn't just fear God, didn't just have an awe of his, of his majesty. They also loved him, and they thought about him constantly. To such an extent that their mind was a thinking and connecting to the upper worlds, to the point where they knew their way around in these different worlds. Meaning, that at all times, a Kadosh Baruch Hu was on their mind and they were connecting to a Kadosh Baruch Hu at the highest possible level. This is why the moment anyone created any type of disconnect between them and a Kadosh Baruch Hu because of making them upset because of making them sad, there would be an immediate reaction, not by the sage, but by a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Because Rabbi Yochanan was constantly connected to the Shekhinah. The moment he heard that someone in his Bet Midrash does not believe the words of the sages, it created such sorrow in him that someone is not connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that that sorrow that Rabbi Yochanan felt for that moment, as he's glued to, his, to, to the Shekhinah, created a reaction. Where HaKadosh Baruch Hu had to eliminate this creation that created sorrow in the one that loved him, Rabbi Yochanan. And therefore, turning him into a heap of bones had to happen. 
the moment Rabbi Yossi saw that his beautiful daughter were causing the sons of HaKadosh Baruch Hu to sin, he felt such sorrow for those boys of how they're sinning simply because his daughter looks a certain way and how they're going to separate themselves from their master, from their creator, from their father in heaven as a result of just a piece of meat. It created such sorrow in him. HaKadosh Baruch Hu had to turn her into dust because that was his will. That was the will of her own father. Why? It's better to be dust than to cause Jewish people to sin. The daughter of the Khatam Sufil was a beautiful girl. And her father found her crying one day. And he asked her, my daughter, why are you crying? And she just kept reading Taylim and crying more. And he said, please tell me, I beg you, what are you, why are you crying? Something happened. Did, 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 are you sick? Why are you crying so? She said, Abba, I generally don't go outside because I know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu made me very beautiful. But today I went outside because I needed to get something from the store. And this man looked at me. And if this beauty is going to create sins in the world, I'm crying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu to please make me ugly so I don't make his kids sin. The Khatam Sofer cried and he says, Amen. May your wish be fulfilled and may HaKadosh Baruch Hu take this beauty of yours and give you a son that's going to be such a chacham He's going to bring light to the world. And until this day, the descendants of the Khatam Sofer's daughter, who cried to be ugly, until this day, she has descendants that are bringing light to the world. Why? When a person loves a Kadosh Baruch Hu, their self-interest disappears. their interest now becomes the will of Hashem. So before you say you love Hashem, do you even know the will of Hashem or do you just know what you want? If you love Hashem when He gives you stuff, that simply means you love yourself. If you love your wife when she gives you stuff, that means you love yourself. If you love your husband when he gives you stuff, that means you love yourself. It doesn't necessarily make you a bad person. But at the very least, you need to know that if you really want to love somebody else, it requires you to give some room to that love by taking away some of your own selfishness. Your will has to turn into our will. If you want to love Hashem, you have to do what the Mishnah in Perkei Avot says. Turn your will into His will. And He will then turn His will into yours. That's a true connection. And that connection is eternal. There is no future without it. Because once it exists... There is no separation. This Rabotai is why Rabbi Yossi Aglili had no qualms about helping his ex-wife. Because although she was a bad woman, there was certainly no love there. She was still a Jew. She was still the daughter of his father in heaven. And he loves HaKadosh Baruch Hu so much that whether it's to help this Jew that hurt me or that Jew that helped me, there's no difference. 
if I can help one of the children of Hashem, why wouldn't I? As that is the will of Hashem. If I can do anything to make the love of my life happy, even if it's only for one minute, even if it's for five minutes, even if it's for one day, and of course, even if it's for a week or a year, why wouldn't I do it? The only time somebody thinks of things that make themselves happy is simply because there's nobody else in their life that's worth loving, or at least they don't know what love is. Tonight, we learned what love looks like. Perhaps all of us need to ask ourselves, do we really love anybody aside from ourselves? Once you have that answer, you'll know exactly what you need to work on. And then you can utilize those ideas, those thoughts, those new feelings in order to create more love between you and your spouse. And of course, in order to create more love between you and your Father in Heaven. Because He certainly loves you. But the same token, it comes a time where you need to express that love back. Kol Tuv, Pachah Ba'atzlacha, Bezat Hashem, we'll see each other again and learn again tomorrow. This book that I received in uh, Aventura Chabad is one of the best books I ever read and I recommend it to everybody who wants some knowledge in the Torah to get this book. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat. Hashem says, listen, you can do this, or you can do this. For me, it's pretty simple. At the end of the day, we came from dust, and we have to take a step back, truly understand what the purpose of being here is. Hashem didn't have to put us here. I want you guys to do good. I'm going to give you each and every single one of you a test. I want you to pass it. I'm going to give you the tools to pass it. You have the choice. Because guess what? At the end of that test, the reward is going to be amazing. Avram got a test. Yitzhak Avinu got a test. Yaakov Avinu. Yosef. I don't think I can pass that. It's a life. I said I could. Any man today that said they can pass Yosef athletic test is lying. Flat out. And to see what they were able to do, wow. If they can do it under those circumstances, I could never imagine if my siblings would throw me in a pit. I would be depressed. I'd be angry. But to see these examples and to really learn and know that Hashem is everywhere is something that is key to growing.